Hey y'all! In this video we're going to demonstrate and do a little bit of exploration with the Vector Texture Tool. The Vector Texture Tool itself is available in Cut 2D, both Desktop and Pro, VCarve Desktop and Pro, and Aspire. This portion of this video applies to all three. However, when we get over here to the texturing toolpath itself, that is not available in Cut 2D Desktop or Pro. But I'll show you an alternative that will allow you to use the Vector Texture Tool in Cut 2D. So, to get started, Let's go ahead and get into the Vector Texture Tool and we'll just look at some of the basic parameters here. Starting up at the top and that is the angle of the texture. If I set my angle to zero and I just preview everything else that I have here, we can see that we have a wave pattern that runs straight horizontal in X. If I add a positive angle, and I can put any angle I want in here, if I add a positive angle of 45 degrees and click preview, we can now see that this wave pattern is projected from the bottom left corner uphill to the top right corner. Now if I make this a negative angle, go to negative 45 degrees and preview. It's just the opposite. It runs downhill from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. So that's our angle. And I think I'm going to go ahead and leave this as is. Let's use a negative 45 degree angle and just see what we come up with. Now we'll get down into line spacing. The line spacing is the distance between each of these individual vectors here. And you'll see that there is some variation. As the wave is formed in some of these little troughs here, and especially in between the peaks and the troughs, the lines can kind of get further apart and closer together. Now we can adjust to that variation by bringing this slider up and click preview. And now we can see that the line spacing is a lot more varied in kind of a random pattern. So we no longer have a nice even design. If you set your line spacing and you decide you don't like it, you can do a few things. You can either adjust for more variation, preview it, which can place some vectors right on top of one another. You can vary it down a little bit, preview that. Or, let's bring up the variation a little bit more so we have a more dramatic spacing. Okay. Or, you can just preview again. And you'll notice it changes every time you hit preview. That's because every time you preview, even though you haven't changed your criteria at all, the vector line spacing it generates is random. So what we have right here is going to be completely different from the next preview I click. Now you can keep doing this until you find something you like. And when you do find something you like, stop previewing that portion of it and move down to another area down below here. So each time you hit preview, it's going to give you a different pattern out here slightly. We'll get down in here into the wave parameters. And the wave parameters affect this wave right here. Now I have this set, my amplitude set, for a half inch. And what that means is, if I zoom in here, the difference in height here, the top of this peak, to the bottom of that trough is one half inch. If 
I increase that to, let's say, 1.5 inches and preview it, you can see the waves just got much bigger. The difference between this trough and this peak is now one and a half inches. And you can keep increasing that as much as you want. 3.0, not 30. We'll preview that. So you can get some pretty dramatic wave effects by adjusting the amplitude. And again, that's the distance between the top of the peak and the bottom of the trough. That's the wave height. We can also adjust the wave length. And the wave length is the distance between where the wave starts to cross the center line, goes up to the peak, comes down to the trough, and comes back to that center line. So the distance from the one trough to another is basically what you're covering, or one peak to another. And if we make that larger and preview it, we stretch that wave out. If we make it smaller and preview it, we shorten that wavelength down. So you can use a combination of your angle, your line spacing, your amplitude, and your wavelength to come up with a bunch of different variations. And again, every time you hit preview, it'll generate more and more random line spacing until you find a pattern that you like. Let's move down to noise. If we zoom in and look, right now our waves are nice and smooth. And they follow a pretty regular pattern. The noise is how much of a distortion to that wave vector you want to add. Now, right now I have it set at zero. If I bring that noise up to maximum and preview it, come in here and take a look and we can see that these vectors have all become jagged in a random pattern. We've introduced a lot of noise to those vectors themselves. If I bring it down to somewhere about the middle and preview it, it's a lot less chaotic, but they don't look nice and uniformly smooth. This comes in handy when you're attempting to mimic a wood grain pattern, which can be done with this software. Stretch out your amplitude and your wavelength, and you can get a very nice faux wood grain pattern. For example, let's bring that down to 0.25, stretch that wavelength out to 18 inches, preview it, and you have almost a regular line. Tighten up on the line spaces, preview that, and you can simulate a faux wood grain in just about any solid material, foam, MDF, etc. Maybe introduce a little bit more on my amplitude. There we go. Bump up the noise. And there we go. That's more of a rough, rustic wood grain appearance. So, playing with your angle, line spacing, amplitude, wavelength, and just keep previewing. And you can get a lot of different textures that can add a lot of interest to your projects. When you come across a pattern that you like and you want to keep that pattern, you have a couple of choices. We can just go ahead and click OK and this texture pattern will be saved to layer 1, which is our active layer. Or you have the option 
of placing the texture on another layer. Just click that check mark and we'll call that chaos because that's what it is basically. And I'll click OK. You'll see my layer manager has changed to chaos. I'll click it. It's created that layer. It's put these vectors on that layer and it's turned that layer on. If I go to layer one as the active layer and turn off chaos, I have nothing there. I can turn that layer back on, make it the active layer, and I'm all set. Now, suppose we want to use the vector texturing tool in conjunction with other vectors. We can create those other vectors. Let me go back up to layer one. We'll shut off the chaos layer. Let's use some text. I'll go into my draw text tool and I'll just type my name here. Close that. I'll tap the F9 key to put my name in the middle. And I want to go into move and transform mode, hold down shift, and make my name a little bit larger there. I can click off to deselect my name. Now, something that we have to be careful of, something that we have to watch out for, is using textures with other vectors. It's going to depend on the tool that you use to carve these textures. If you're going to use a V-bit or a ball nose, remember that these texture vectors have start points and end points. Let me show you what I mean. If I now create a texture by selecting the text and just using this texture tool, not making any other changes, click Preview, it's going to apply that texture inside those letters. Now that could be exactly what you want. In fact, let's go ahead, click OK, go over, and we'll do something that can be done in Cut 2D. Select that texture, and I'll use a profile toolpath. I'm going to machine that down, let's say 30 thousandths. 30 thousandths, so slightly less than a sixteenth of an inch deep. I'm going to use a 60 degree V bit. I'm going to machine on the vector. I want the point to follow these individual vectors. And we'll call this profile texture. And we'll calculate it. And I'll give it a toolpath color of black so that you can see it. And we'll preview that toolpath. Okay, that doesn't look too bad. That's not bad at all, as a matter of fact. We went with a very shallow texture. Now I can come back, deselect. I want to select my text, close my preview, another profile toolpath, and I'm not going to change anything else. I want to go with the same cut depth, machine on the vector. And we'll call this text outline. We'll calculate it. I'll give that a toolpath color of black as well. And we'll preview it. That actually turned out very well. Better than I expected. Much better than I expected. But now, supposing you didn't want to carve the texture in the letters. You wanted to carve it out here and leave the letters alone. That's where we have to be careful. Let me reset the preview. Go back to a straight Z view. Close our preview window. Go back into the 2D view. Here we have the issue, and that is, 
if we click off out here, go over to our drawing tab, create a vector texture, we're going to get all kinds of confused here. So what I want to do is I want to grab that texture, right click, move to layer, new layer. And I want to put that on a new layer we'll call text, texture. I don't want to make it visible. We'll click OK. Now I still have that texture. It's just turned off. I want to do the background. What I'll need out here is I'll need a vector somewhere out here so that the texture tool knows that the texture belongs out here and not inside the text. So, just quite simply, we'll do draw a rectangle. And I want the rectangle to be the exact same size as my material. So, I'll come over here to my width in X, highlight whatever's in there, and type X equals. It just made the width of my rectangle the same as the width of the material I placed in the job setup. I'll come down here to Y and I'll tap Y equals and I just made my height in Y the same as the material. So I'll click create and it doesn't look like anything has happened but if I come out here and select I now have a vector that's the same size as my material. So I can select that vector, hold down shift, select my text, go up here to my vector texture and not touch it, just do the same thing. I'll put this texture on another one called background texture, preview that, Click OK. Now, my texture is to the outside of my text, both inside, in here, in, in these inside vectors or areas here, and out here on my material. But here's where we get into the problems I was talking about earlier. These texture lines run right up to characters in our letters. Now depending upon how we do this, that may be okay, it may not be okay. Because remember, the bit has a radius and that radius can carve into the character over here. So let's go into our profile tool path and I'm not going to change a thing. We'll go for the same cut depth on the vector and we'll call this background texture, calculate it, and I'll give it a color black so you can see it, and we'll preview it. Then once again, we'll come over here. I believe I can use my text outline because that hasn't changed. We'll preview that one. And again, that worked out OK. We don't have any cuts inside of that outline. Just know that if you're going to use deeper cut depths, be very careful. Preview often because the radius of that tool may come over and cut into your letter. This is using the texture tool in conjunction with a profile tool path. That option is available again in Cut 2D, VCarve, and Aspire. Now we'll switch over to the texture tool path, which is not available in Cut 2D. And this gives us a few more options. Let me go ahead and reset my preview. 
close my preview window, go over here to the 2D view, and I'm going to go back to layer 1. We'll shut off the background texture, and I'm going to move my text to a new layer, and we'll call that text. Shut off the visibility. Now my text is up here on this layer, but it's now invisible. Let's create a new vector texture, and I'm going to change this criteria. Let's go with a line spacing of a quarter of an inch, and I'll put my uh, variation, yeah, I'll leave my variation roughly where it was, and I'll go with an amplitude of one inch and a wavelength of two inches and I'll bring my noise down to zero. And I'm not going to place that. Yes, I will place it on a different layer. I will call this Texture Toolpath. And I'll preview that. Now that's created my texture here. When I click OK, to accept that, it also creates the texture toolpath layer. So, let's see how using the texture toolpath with the vector texture tool works and how I can get some other options. We'll switch over to the toolpath tab, and with these vectors selected, I'll come up here to the texturing toolpath. Very important. Normally, I start at the top of the form, but it's very easy to forget this step, so I do it from the very beginning. Put a check mark right here. Use selected vectors as pattern. Now, when you do that, you see that most of our texture settings become grayed out. We can't change them. That's okay because the vectors themselves are going to dictate these settings. We don't need to set a max or minimum cut length because it's the cut length of the vector, just as an example. So what we want to use now is figure out which bit we want to use. Now we can use a V bit, but I'm going to uh, demonstrate this one with a quarter inch ball nose and select that. My start depth I'm going to make zero. That's the surface of the material. Down here we have a maximum cut depth. I'm going to go ahead and leave that at 100 thou. And my minimum cut depth I'm going to leave that at 20 thou. What the texture toolpath is going to do is vary the cut depth along the way, just at random. The deepest it's going to cut is a hundred thousandths of an inch. The shallowest it will cut is twenty thousandths. I'm not going to change anything else. Let's just go with the name Texture Toolpath Ball Nose. And we'll calculate that. Now I'm going to kind of rock it back a little bit. And we'll go ahead and preview that toolpath. Now as we watch it carve, you'll see that it's varying the cut depth as it carves. Okay, with the toolpath simulation finished, we can look here at the edge and we can see that in some spots it started cutting real deep and in other spots it cut real shallow. And there really isn't any rhyme or reason to those variations. 
That leaves an interesting texture to the toolpath. But if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that there are some potential problems here. We have some flat areas up here that were uncut. And that's OK if that's what you're looking for. The other potential problem, though, that is probably more important is these ridges right here, these very sharp ridges. Depending upon the type of material you're trying to machine, these ridges may or may not work. That introduces a lot of cleanup sanding because chip out or tear out could be very prevalent. So that is something to keep in mind, something to watch out for. Now we can vary this a little bit, but not really all that much. The easiest way, if we didn't get a result that we like, be to reset, go back into that tool path, and let's try a larger bit. I'll go with a half inch ball nose, which is the largest I have. We'll select that, we'll calculate it, and we'll preview that tool path. Okay, with our simulation finished, we can kind of get in here and see that that half inch bit removed most of the flat areas that we had before, but not all of them. There may be a few flats here and there, and the difference in cut depth is even more apparent because it is a larger bit. And that can make for some interesting textures. But it can also lead to longer machining times. This would be 30 minutes, roughly, to carve this texture. So that's just one example of some of the things you can do using the Texture Tool path along with the Vector Texture Tool. Using the Texture Tool path will allow you to vary the cut depth and using the profile toolpath will keep it at a uniform cut depth for a more uniform appearance. Let's try one more here. We'll reset the preview and close that. I'll go back to a straight Z view and making sure I still have these selected. I'll go back, do another texture toolpath, only this time We'll select a 90 degree V bit. Select that, and I'm not going to change anything else. Make sure to use the selected vectors as a pattern. Max cut depth of 100 thousandths of an inch. Minimum cut depth of 20 thousandths of an inch. We'll call this texture. Toolpath V bit, and we'll calculate and preview this toolpath. And with our simulation finished, we can kind of rock it back and see that we've got a completely different appearance. We still have our varied cut depths, but with that V bit versus a ball nose. Not only did the toolpath take a little bit longer, 35 minutes instead of 30 minutes, but the variation is a lot more stark. Again, if you're cutting something like a dense foam or MDF, this may work out just fine for you. But if you're attempting to cut this in something stringy like pine, or mahogany or something that likes to peel rather than cut, this may be a problem type of texture to carve on those materials. Likewise, it may be difficult on something like Wenge that likes to, that's very brittle and likes to shatter. 
So experimentation with scrap and experimentation with various tools, cutting depths, cutting patterns is normally the way to go. So using the texturing toolpath in conjunction with the vector texture tool is one way of bringing your work up to the next level and adding that extra added detail and perceived value to your project. My best advice is to get in and play with it. By getting in and adjusting these and playing with the different variations, you can come up with some very cool textures and designs that will, again, set your work apart from the competition. So I hope you got something out of this video. And if you did, I hope you'll give me a thumbs up. Now, as a reminder, this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific time, I'll be hosting a live Q&A session where we can discuss the vector texturing tool or the texturing toolpath or anything else we've discussed in this video. Again, that's today at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific time, right here on my YouTube channel. And I'll put a link to that live Q&A session down in the description box of this video. These live Q&A sessions are a great reason to go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Look down there for that red subscribe button and click it. Then right next to that subscribe button is a little bell icon. Click that icon and then click it again and select all notifications. Then you'll receive a notification to your computer or your mobile device every time I post a video and every time I go live. So I hope to see you this afternoon for the live Q&A session. And as always, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch, and y'all take care.